All right, thank you so much for joining in on the Green Path webinar today, navigating the world of financial services. We are so excited to share with you some of our knowledge. With me today, I have Green Path's learning experience designer, Omari Hall. My name is Tina Ponder, and I am a partner experience manager here with Green Path. I see some familiar faces here, so welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. And I want to give Omari a chance to introduce himself to all of you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, my name is Omari Hall, uh, and I'm a learning experience designer here at Green Path. Okay, great. So, Omari, before we kind of jump into all of the good stuff that we'll be talking about today, can you give us a little bit more information about what a learning experience designer does? What do y'all do? Yeah, so uh, at Green Path, we get to spend a lot of time thinking about human centered design. Um, and basically, what that means is creating experiences with the client, uh, the people at the center. So, for example, research suggests that classroom style learning is one way to teach that can be effective. Another effective strategy might be to create uh, digital experiences that may simulate real scenarios and help to give context to the information that we're learning around financial wellness. Thank you so much. Yeah, it sounds it sounds to me like very, you know, hands on experiences, experiences that we can relate to and experiences that are really tangible. Awesome. Definitely. All right, so what we'll be covering today with Omari is we'll give you just a quick overview of who Green Path is. A lot of you might be new to Green Path. A lot of you might not know about us. So we'll go ahead and give you kind of a quick 101. We also want to talk to you about what financial wellness is. So Green Path Financial Wellness, financial wellness is in our name. What does that mean? Um, we want to talk to you today about what financial services are. So we'll be talking about alternative financial services versus versus traditional financial services. And then we'll do a quick Q&A with Omari, specifically about his work with inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And we will leave time at the end for questions and of course wrap up. We want to encourage everybody who's with us today to give Green Path a call to go through a financial wellness session with us. It's free and confidential with Green Path. The phone number is up here on the screen. And we really encourage you to take advantage of this resource that's available to you. All right. So kind of jumping in to get us started, we would like to tell you a little bit about who Green Path is, who we are, and what we do. Green Path started out in the basement of the Michigan Credit Union League and have been around since 1961. For nearly 60 years, we've been there for people on their financial wellness journeys. We like to say that we're there for people during the good times and the not so good times. So we're there during all of life's curveballs. Um, we do encourage you to visit greenpath.com to learn more information about us. And for those of you who are new to Green Path and just learning about us today, as I mentioned before, please know that our sessions are free, they're confidential, so we make sure that we take your privacy very seriously. We are licensed to counsel in all 50 states uh, by phone. In some cases, we do have field offices in certain locations. Right now, because of the pandemic, of course, those are closed. However, we are still available here over the phone. We offer the counseling in English and in Spanish on demand. We also have a telelanguage service. So if you do have any family members or friends or you're more comfortable talking about finances in a different language, we offer the telelanguage service in over 300 languages. Um, Green Path, we are also a nonprofit HUD approved housing counseling agency. So, in addition to being a nonprofit financial wellness organization and education organization, we do provide housing coaching and counseling, and we are approved by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development to provide mortgage counseling as well as rental counseling. And really, our mission is to help people. We want to empower people to lead financially healthy lives and really be there for everyone on their their financial wellness journey so that they can achieve their dreams. All right. Um, so before we got into the meat of the conversation today, I wanted to pose a question to the group. 
Um, it's interesting to consider when we think about uh, access to financial education and conversa conversations around finance or the lack thereof. Um, tell us about what you learned about finances when you were growing up and how. So we actually want to take a few minutes here to kind of reflect on that. And if you wouldn't mind entering some of those thoughts into the chat for us. So you should see on the lower right hand side of your screen um, a Q&A box, but you should also see a chat function. And we just want you to take a couple of minutes to chat in, you know, tell us what you learned about finances when you were growing up and how did you learn about those? We're going to turn on our thinking music and kind of go through what's rolling on in. Oh, Mari, I'm seeing some really good answers here. Yeah. Um, so uh, some themes, some common themes that are reflected here are um, not getting a lot of formal education through high school or college, um, but picking up what you can from family. Um, uh, some teachers, some it looks like some folks did have a, a, a personal finance class in high school, which is which is really awesome. Um, and then there's other folks that kind of had to figure it out on their own with opening savings accounts at an early age um, to kind of to kind of figure it out on their own. But, it, but what, really what we're seeing here, it seems like the common theme is a combination of maybe not having a ton of formal uh, opportunities for education, but learning a lot from your parents and your family and your immediate circle. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of like the family, like the parents and the grandparents. Um, and I'm also seeing like some sayings that people picked up from parents and grandparents too, which I love. <laughs> yeah, those are always good. Um, and it's And it's really nice that a lot of these things are really solid and they stay even as finance has started to change and some of the math on some of the stuff is a little different than it used to be a lot of these concepts still hold up which is really good yeah this is awesome so we love hearing about all of your thoughts and ideas on this and then also just kind of your experiences because it really does shape how we interact with the world and how we interact with money and funds right and it really helps us to understand why we make the choices we make. So, absolutely. you know, as far as what y'all learned about finances when you were growing up and how you did, you know, I know for, for me, we didn't have anything formal that was like, this is the formal financial wellness definition. This is what it means. So we did want to share with you because we are talking a lot about financial wellness today. We wanted to kind of give you a framework and share with you the definition that we use at Green Path, which is from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and really financial wellness, I always say it's much more about how you're feeling it's about how you're doing it's more, much more about your your financial health not about wealth right so it's not about how much money you have it's really about the quality of life that you're living and financial wellness is made up of four components that you see on the screen here and the first component of financial wellness is feeling in control of your finances so feeling in control could mean you know i track my expenses i keep a spending plan or a budget i'm not living paycheck to paycheck um, and I'm not completely out of control. I've got some kind of sense and security in my abilities and how I'm tracking that. So really how well we are in control of our day-to-day -day finances, it's a critical piece to achieving our goals and dreams. Definitely. Um, and the next aspect of financial wellness is gonna be the ability to absorb financial shock. And that's really just a fancy way of saying emergency savings, right? Um, now more than ever in a COVID environment, we've learned how important it is to be able to adjust and to be flexible, um, having that emergency savings. And again, not necessarily having like a, 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 a you know, a, a secret vault of, of wealth that you can dive into, but just maybe a, a month or two's worth of savings to absorb maybe a missed mortgage payment or a car payment in case of an emergency. Because as we, as 2020 has made abundantly clear for all of us, it's not a matter of when there'll be an emergency that you'll need to kind of dig into, uh, but 
Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So in, in this case, having that ability to absorb financial shock will allow you to, uh, will help you to avoid falling behind on some of your other obligations and still be able to keep yourself afloat in case of hardship. All right, great. And sorry about that. I was just trying to close something out on my screen that I thought I had shut down. All right. So the third component I think is my favorite because I always was the child that needed to know the why. And I think I still I still am that way. I still ask the why. Why is why do I have to do all of this work? What what is this for? Um, and really my favorite part of what we do at Green Path and part of our counseling is we help people establish and create their financial goals to get where they want to be. So the third component of financial wellness is having the ability to meet financial goals. If you're looking for like a personal trainer for your finances, I really encourage you to give Green Path a call so that we can go over um, the financial goals with you, kind of get those created, and we can take those steps so that you can buy that home. Or, you know, if you are looking to replenish your emergency savings, I know our household is. We had a job loss and then a reduction in income during this COVID shenanigans. Um, we really want to help you to figure out how do I get that replenished? How do I make it realistic and how do I make it work for me? Absolutely. Um, and the fourth and final component of financial of the financial wellness definition is the ability to or the flexibility to enjoy life. So financial wellness is all about being happy, healthy and living a quality of life. And again, not necessarily about wealth, um, but the flexibility to enjoy life means that you're able to realize your dreams. Uh, what might that look like for you? Maybe it's taking a vacation every year. Maybe it's being able to afford your kids after school activities. Uh, maybe it's you know, being able to enjoy the holidays without going broke. Um, at the end of the day, really what financial wellness is, it's a critical component to helping you achieve your dreams and live the life that you want. Yeah. And as we're looking at the definition, um, before we move on, you don't have to chat this in. I do, though, encourage you to think about where am I on my financial wellness journey? Where do I fit into this definition? I know for our household, we're really in that capacity to absorb shock. You know, that's really where we're kind of fitting. Like we've done a lot of work 2019 and 2020. We did a lot of work on the feeling and control part <laughs> and kind of getting those good habits going. But now it's like, okay, let's prepare. Um, so I, I really am looking forward to like moving more into the ability to meeting financial goals, which I know will come once we kind of have the basics covered. Absolutely. I can relate to that uh, for sure. Um, I would say at this stage, for me, it's really about um, absorbing that financial shock of the adjustments having to be made during COVID um, and also working towards becoming debt free. Um, I've had some some uh, personal, um, you know, uh, family situations that have caused me to take on a little bit more of a leadership role in terms of, of uh, managing the finances, which you, which is one thing when you do it for your job to help other people with their finances, but it's a different thing entirely when you have to apply that knowledge to, to your own situation. So rest assured, uh, those of us who may be going through this, you're not alone. And even even us uh, experts are uh, continually having to learn these things uh, as we go along. So, uh, but it's helped me. The work that I've done here at Green Path has helped me keep in perspective that the solutions are always, um, or the strategies at least, are always within arms, arms with. All right. So with that in mind, uh, we also recognize that we all don't share the same lived reality, right? We know that um, we all face unique challenges that may make achieving these financial goals a little bit more difficult. Uh, with that in mind, we would like you to tell us about some of the barriers that you may have faced or may be still facing in your financial journey. So again, why don't we take a couple of minutes to chat some of these responses? So again, what were uh, some barriers that you have faced in your financial wellness journey. Yeah, and Omari, you mentioned that like you've had some family things that have happened to lead you to be like more of like head of household, like more financial responsibility. Sure. And I've had the same, like I think being young, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties and like having the student loans, that's definitely a barrier. And then when you throw on like taking care of other family members, like I'm a caretaker for my mom and I, um, I'm, got guardianship over my younger brother who's a teenager. I mean, that is a barrier that's definitely been thrown in my way um, on my financial wellness journey. Absolutely. Yeah, I see like unexpected popping up. What else are you saying? Yeah, unemployment, um, unexpected expenses. Again, I imagine that whether it's related to COVID or not, these are things that folks face all the time. Um, one thing that I really resonate with here uh, is a lack of taught financial literacy. Um, and, and we'll, we'll get more into that a little bit later, but this idea of there being a scarcity or, um, a, uh, maybe a, in an imbalance in terms of the availability of financial resources is something that uh, really can affect, um, the, that journey towards financial wellness. Again, yeah, I like that. Unexpected expenses here seems to be a, a theme here. Not having a safety net, we talked about that absorbing financial shock, um, maybe living paycheck to paycheck and, and feeling insecure in that sense, or just not really feeling confident that if an emergency hit that you'd be able to, to, to maintain. You were saying, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm just saying that I see a lot of like life changes in here too. Like people are throwing out like um, health costs or like my income went from one income, you know, down to nothing or two incomes down to one. I'm a single parent now, divorce, like life changes. You know, we always tell our, our people that any time that you're going through a major life event, it's a great time to give Green Path a call to help you on your, your health journey because your financial wellness, it's part of your overall health. Like I know with all of my family changes um, and these barriers, like it's impacted my own physical health too. So I, I think that's really, you know, it's it's really nice to see in a way, even though these are barriers that we're not alone and like we're all going through this together. Absolutely. So when we think about barriers, um, this is where the idea of financial inclusion comes into play. Um, and it really, that's about uh, achieving your financial goals and dreams uh, and, and, and living in a world where uh, everyone is included in that uh, achieving of those dreams, regardless of your background. So if you do a quick Google search, you'll find that the definition of financial uh, inclusion uh, is the availability or the availability and equality of opportunities to access financial resources. And while this is an adequate definition, I think it would serve us to go a little bit deeper. Uh, furthermore, Greenpath believes that in order for, or excuse me, in order to create opportunity to access financial services, it's essential to do the work to understand how um, to understand how the circumstances of another underrepresented group may be different from that of the standard client, and then use these data points to create new or modify existing programs specifically to meet the needs of these communities. So let's talk a little more about our personal stories and backgrounds as a starting point to open up that discussion about financial inclusion, access barriers, and uh, maximization of financial services. Tina? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to talk about our our stories and our backgrounds. I just want to I want to re like reread that definition of financial inclusion because I still am like wrapping my brain around that. Um can we just read that one more time? Sure. Uh or do you want the the Google definition or the Green Path? Uh, I, I don't have the Green that. Path definition. Like if okay. I was asking you what financial inclusion was, what is that what would you say to me? Like Tina, this is what it means. What it means is is doing the work again. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, go away from my notes here. What it really really means is is seeking understanding um, as to what makes the circumstances of one community different from that of another, and then doing what's necessary to um, overcome some of those boundaries as best you can, and create a scenario where. Uh, there is access to the same financial opportunity specifically with those barriers in mind. So, for example, the, the um, uh, issues that may be plaguing uh, a community prim primarily, um, uh, you know, a primarily black community may be different from that of a suburban community, right? And so we need to make sure that we have the tools in place to 
um, provide similar opportunity so that the end game, the end goal, right, the outcomes are similar and the outcomes are, are equitable. Does that make more sense? Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you for going over that again. And I, I like to hear things like in layman's terms too, right? <laughs> so I loved that. Yeah. Um, so you're going to see some of like what Amari was kind of defining in our stories because we, when we started doing this webinar together and we started talking to each other, we're like, wow, like we actually have a lot in common with our backgrounds. Um, and some of the barriers have been similar and some different. So my kind of upbringing is that I had a father in my life up until I was about eight and they were kind of like my my family my mom was a stay-at-home mom my dad was like your 1980s like sales powerhouse made tons of money and then all of a sudden like one day that was gone based on some health issues that my dad had and then we became uh you know a family where my mom was raising three kids by herself completely um so we moved from you know the house that we were living in with my dad and we moved to um a, a different suburb so i grew up in the suburbs i am a first generation college student so you know even though i had a, a pretty good buildup of wealth my first half of my life um the second half of my life was very challenging and i think that the most challenging time in my life was when I moved out and went on my own as a first generation college student. Like I didn't know anything. I applied to one college because I didn't know any better, didn't know I could do better. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm just going through the motions. This is what I'm doing. And being raised by my mom, you know, I still, when I was in college, had to help her quite a bit with money. I paid for her utility bill. I paid for her electric bill up until I was probably 28 years old and I was like living out of state on my own and yet her electricity bill was like still in my name. So I, I've had a lot of like unique challenges growing up um, and that's been my background with finances and I was telling Omari that most of what I learned was not from my parents. It was more like modeled behavior of like, I don't want to be stressed out like that. I don't want to live my life that way or things that I had picked up from my grandparents, but they didn't, nobody ever spelled it out for me, so. I was on mute there. Uh, absolutely, um, and I really appreciate you sharing some of that with us here. I really resonate with a lot of what you brought to light. Um, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, which is a city that many of us no doubt know um, has had a lot of challenges, uh, challenges like a decimated economy, um, disenfranchisement, um on a citywide level um and the reality is of the situation is that these challenges have disproportionately affected communities of color um and i can imagine that many uh urban areas that have a similar history probably uh, have uh, similar outcomes right like uh, for example uh, i imagine it's it's probably probably feels pretty familiar that communities all across the United States have uh, communities like Detroit um, have severely limited access to resources and information on financial literacy, in particular financial uh, education. Um, and as a result, productive conversations around financial health can be made harder. Uh, and that misinformation and, and mystery around areas like credit and budgeting uh, may become a little bit more pervasive. Um, and so this may lead to the entry points. And when I say entry points, what I mean is um, where you might start uh, interacting within the financial system, whether that means getting a bank account, applying for a loan, starting a savings plan, right? These entry points can sometimes be harder to access for members of communities like this and like the one that I grew up around. Uh, furthermore, um, fiduciary institutions like banks, credit unions are often scarcer in these communities and instead what one might find a little bit um, more easily would be some alternative banking services um does that make sense yeah i think like what's resonating with me is you saying entry points and like kind of defining it just even for me having a definition of what it is 
it can help me to navigate things easier. So just knowing the, that like, oh, wow, like this is an entry point, right? Like te teaching my 16 year old brother about this stuff, like I'm trying to create a path for him so he doesn't have to go through all of the hoops and barriers and roadblocks that I've had to experience, you know, trying to make that easier for him. And just one note on that, I mean, the, w w the importance of pointing out something like an entry point is really to, to focus or really to kind of bring to light uh, relating back to the to the discussion around financial inclusion, that these mm -hmm. entry points may be different in some communities with, that have had a certain experience versus another, right? If you're someone who has grown up with support around financial literacy, your parents got you set up on a savings account when you were, you know, in middle school, you had you were a, a, a co um, borrower on your parents' credit card ever since you were five years old, right? Um, these these uh, steps that were taken proactively to help bolster your financial uh, potential outcomes. Um, that's a really that's a really awesome privilege to have that. The reality of the situation is that there are a lot of communities who the many different reasons, uh, some of which I just discussed, may not have had that sort of support and their entry points into the financial world. Um, they may feel a lot less prepared. Right, and it's it's important to re to recognize that this is not their fault, right? This is the this is the result of, um, you know, we could give an entire pod an entire podcast an entire webinar on this topic, but it's it's as a result of um, a lot of disenfranchisement, and 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 our goal here, while focusing on inclusion, um, is to make sure that we understand what those barriers are and create bridges to help folks overcome those, so that we can all end up at the same outcomes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love the elaboration on that because it leads really well into into the next question. And mm -hmm. I know I'm going to share some more right about kind of my background as we get into more of the the services uh, part of the discussion. But I think one of the, the questions that we really wanted to ask everyone is what is one thing that you wish you would have known about financial services years ago? So. If you want to throw your answers into the chat box, Omari and I are going to kind of talk about this because we've talked a lot about this as we were creating this webinar. Um, I was explaining to Omari that I've never felt like I've belonged anywhere. I've always felt like I'm an outsider. And I know that that sounds very cliche, but especially in the financial world, I've kind of had one foot in one world and one foot in the other because I did grow up in the suburbs. I grew up in a very affluent community in Michigan where like we had one of the top school districts and everybody had parents who were like lawyers or engineers. Um, I had friends who had parents that were doctors, you know, and I learned that this is what wealth looks like, but I don't have it. <laughs> you know, we grew up in like a one bedroom apartment and I had an eviction notice every single month. So, you know, one of the things that I wish I would have like known about financial services is that it's, you have the opportunity. Like, I wish somebody would have been like, you know, here's the credit union. Here's how you apply for a bank account. Like I got thrown into school and I was like, oh shoot, like I need a bank account. Like I learned about it from talking to other people. Like I got a work study job and they're like, where are you gonna put your money? I didn't even think about that. I didn't realize that I needed a home for my money. And mind you, one of my mom's like multiple jobs was working at a bank and she did not pass that to me, you know, because I think, you know, that's just, I don't know if it's financial literacy or if it's like the gap in our education system, it could be a lot of different things. But one of the things that I would have known about is that this is how you hold your money. This is how you start. This is what credit looks like just to give me a starting point. I wish I would have had that. Totally. I can relate to a lot of that. Um, I also see coming into the chat here, um, some, some resonance around that. Um, there's, there's one, uh, comment about budgeting as elementary as it sounds and and certainly right like that's something that even even as a person who's done financial who's worked in the financial world for uh, almost 10 years um, the idea of budgeting when it's your own personal situation is a little different um, as as counselors it's it's easier to be detached and to and to be very deliberate and uh, intentional about the uh feedback that you give to your clients um, but when it's your own personal finance it's, it takes a little bit of extra effort to to make some of the sacrifices that may be necessary um, in order for you to properly budget to properly 
uh, live in a way that that's that is promoting financial health. Um, another thing that I see here is investing, saving, um, uh, whether that be for retirement or just having that nest egg that we were talking about, that ability to absorb financial shock. Uh, and also, not all debt is bad debt. I, I like that a lot because I think that relates to credit, right? Needing to understand how to play the credit game in order to build credit, uh, which then allows you access into um, loans that may have serious impact on the, your quality of life, right? Being able to purchase a car, a, a mortgage. Um, these are things that you need to be involved in the credit game in order to, to build that, that credit enough to allow these things to become possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I was just, I was chatting back to some of our panelists. I'm like, oh my gosh, everything that the attendees are saying, it's just, it's wild to me that money is so important and financial, like just being part of the financial system is so important, but we're like, we don't, we still don't know a lot and like, we don't talk a lot about it together. So it's just really nice to have this space. Totally. All right, so Omari is going to go into some more detail here about some of the common barriers and he'll also kind of talk about some of his learnings as well. Yeah, um, so when we talk about common barriers, um, some of the things that we have here on the screen are, are, are things that, that pop up often. Imperfect credit, uh, lack of cosigners or relationships, uh, language barriers, right, if, if you're someone who uh, where English is your second language, um, uh, uh, maybe a, 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 an unfamiliarity, maybe a lack of access to technology. Um, and really a lot of this really boils down to a lack of financial knowledge or lack of familiarity with the financial system. And again, this, this harkens, back, harkens back to one of our earlier questions that we posed to the group around what were some of the things that you learned on financial literacy coming up? And many of us, um, we're honest about the fact that there wasn't a lot of formal training. A lot of it came from observing our, our families, our, our parents, which is helpful to some extent, but it's a little different when you are in the driver's seat, right? Um, another thing that we really have to realize, and I've, I've, I've kind of intimated at this throughout our presentation here today, um, but one of the realities here uh, is that these situations uh, disproportionately impact communities of color and other disenfranchised communities, right? Uh, 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 communities where there is low income or a lack of, of, of infrastructure or disenfranchisement, right? These things trickle down in a way and, or multiply in a way that make it even harder to escape from that situation. Um, whether it be due to a lack of all other alternatives, like not a lot of banks, not a lot of credit unions in the area, um, or and and in some cases a distrust between some of these communities and that that banking those banking institutions. The good news is there are strides on all sides looking to mend some of those relationships and and make um, these interactions a lot more equitable. Um, with that in mind, uh, Tina, if you if you could go to the next slide here. Yep. Uh, we talked about. Uh, some of those barriers and some of those th those common barriers. As a result of some of these barriers in some communities, what we'll find is alternative services becoming a lot more prevalent. And when I say alternative services here, here are a few of, of the ones that uh, are more common. Um, so you might see something like a payday loan, um, you know, maybe a check cashing service, a title loan where you might put something, uh, offer something that you own like a car for collateral. Uh, rent to own an alternative for taking a loan on something that you might want to buy. Uh, pawn shops where you can sell things off for a quick profit. Um, many of these institutions can can accurately be described as predatory. There's no doubt about it. Um, some leverage the scarcity of other viable financial options um, and more lenient prerequisites. So, for example, uh, lower credit score requirements, no down payments. They leverage that to charge exorbitantly high rates and fees. Um, and, and I recognize that many of us are in different walks of our lives and, and you know, that you might think, well, shouldn't folks know better? I mean, it's, it's really a complicated conversation on multiple fronts. So for example, 
a lot of people do know better, right? They do know that these are harmful situations, um, but whether due to convenience or a lack of any other viable options, the decision to go this route is made anyways. Uh, additionally, it's important to also consider the familiarity uh, that this uh, and space that the community uh, in the community that these places hold right so and this might sound initially odd but when you consider that people who work in these spaces um, are often members of the community themselves it's not hard to imagine a scenario where this type of financial service while definitely uh, more harmful than helpful in most cases can feel less intimidating than a traditional bank or credit union right so the, the point of me going through all that is to is to make sure that we're that we have the empathy to understand that like while these are bad situations um you know there's a why behind it with that being said though now that we understand the why behind some of that we can still stress to clients definitely to avoid these types of alternative financial situations as often as possible they can be very very expensive in the long run and many create cycles that are really hard to break so uh, you know just taking a payday loan for example uh, these loans on average can carry an interest rate of almost 400% um, on average. Uh, additionally, since about 69% of folks who take out payday loans use them for utilities and other reoccurring expenses, um, the client usually ends up rolling that loan over into another payday loan about 80% of the time. And that cycle can last up to 11 months or more right so this is going to result in a scenario where someone can end up spending thousands of dollars on fees and interest despite initially only taking out a 500 hundred dollar loan um, so again just an example of how these are really potentially harmful um, but there is hope though uh, with more traditional banks making uh, financial inclusion more of a priority there's an opportunity for more people to find help so Tina, let's talk a little bit more about some of those traditional banking options. Yeah, I'm just I'm just kind of all, anytime we talk about payday loans and the percent the interest rates and the percentages, I work at Greenpath. I am not a math whiz, um, but whenever you say like 400%, just like wrapping my brain around like what does that even mean? Um, and it really like hit home when I had a client come in to the office that I was working out of in San Antonio. And she was like, I was like, how long have you been paying this loan for? And she's like, I've been working with them for 23 years. So she was probably in that 80% of people that are like rolling it over. And I mm -hmm. think the interest rate was like 167%. And I'm like, okay, like, what does that even mean? Because with traditional financial services, like with a credit card, for example, a high interest rate might be like a 26.99%, right? So it's just kind of yeah. showing like, hey, this is like how much it really is. So when you're kind of thinking about, well, where do I go for these traditional financial services? A lot of what Omari like laid out with the alternatives, like that's like where we used to go like we're growing up like we, mm -hmm. we knew people at the pawn shop like you know like it was like fun to go there like it was familiar they give they give you like free hot dogs they have like raffles like they do a bunch of stuff um and so it's interesting like when i get out into this world it's like no like this is like what traditional is considered right so banks and credit unions are really a great way to start and i wish that i would have known kind of like what is a bank what is a credit union what are the differences between between it. Um, and really banks, they have customers. So banks are typically like for-profit financial institutions and then credit unions in a nutshell are nonprofit member owned financial institutions. There's no right or wrong. There's no like good or bad when it comes to banks or credit unions. Um, I actually utilize both. I have a bank. I also have two accounts with credit unions. Um, and what I love about both of them is that, you know, they, they offer different things. They offer different conveniences. You know, when I moved out of state, it was really nice to have a bank so that when I was living in New York, for example, I could go to an ATM anywhere because it was a larger financial institution. Like I knew right where to find it. 
it was more convenient. But then for savings purposes, you know, credit unions typically tend to have a little bit of higher interest rates on their savings products that I could earn. So um, I utilize them to my advantage. It's almost like playing the credit game, right? It's like, where do you feel comfortable with? You can always go online as well. If you're like, I've never heard of a credit union before. I don't know what's in my area. You can always do a quick Google search. Um, there's I love my credit union website that you can also go to, um, which will send you um, some of this information out so that y'all have it um, at the end of this session so that you can kind of take a look to be like, all right, what, what is the, the cheat sheet on this? But really, you know, credit unions and banks, they typically offer like your traditional credit builder loans, your credit cards. They might offer like a secured credit card, which Omari will talk about a little bit later. And it's just like a, a nice place to hold your money that also offers other products and services to help you to play you know, quote unquote, the credit game a little bit easier. Um, of course, we talked about checking and savings accounts. You know, they credit unions and banks both offer those. Um, when we talk about home loans and auto loans, I think that this is really interesting because when we think about what people tell us, you know, Omari, I counseled for six and a half years. You counseled for a long time as well. And one of the main things that we hear from people that call Green Path is they're interested in buying a home. Like, you know, you ask people, what is your main goal? Or what, what would you like to do? And a lot of people are like, yeah, like, I want to buy a home. Okay, when do you want to buy a home? In the next six to 12 months, right? And sometimes we'll take a look at the situation and we're like, we've got to make a more realistic timeline on this. So home loans are one of those kind of traditional financial services that I would say everybody wants a piece of. Like we all want something that we can invest in. We usually want something that we can call our own. And why not a home, right? Um, that's that's the I guess the basic kind of traditional American dream, if you will. That's kind of the archetype for what it is. Um, so for home loans, when you think about the history of it, when it started, I think like the first home loan was in like 1781 or something like that. But when the mortgage industry really took off in the United States, that was in the 1930s. And that was when the government was giving a lot of kind of um, incentives, you know, to, for people to get homes. And the average age for people getting married back in the day um, was very young. It was 22. And I think the average age nowadays is about 34. And the average home buyer back then was between like 22 and 25. And now it's about 35 years old. So, you know, as time changes, these products, these traditional loan products of having a fixed interest rate for 30 years or a fixed interest rate for 15 years, mortgages really have kind of stayed the same as a traditional loan product. Um, so a lot of people, they're, you know, nearing retirement, or they're going to have to be working for 20 more years by the time they get into a mortgage. So that's just something to really think about when you're thinking about these traditional financial services is what's right for you. And when you are getting into home loans, there are alternative financial services for home loans that might offer that instant gratification, like your land contract to own. I saw that a lot in Texas. Um, I see those a lot out in San Antonio and Austin still where, you know, a private investor might give you a 13% interest rate on a home loan when traditionally with a bank or a credit union, you might get like, you know, three to 5%, right? But you've got to wait a little bit longer to get into your home loan with a lower interest rate. So I think those are just some of the things that when we're talking about traditional versus alternative that I wish we would have known about before we just jumped into the world. And that's something that Green Path can kind of walk you through and talk to you about is like, what makes the best sense for you? How can we help you be financially healthy with the least stress possible? And how can we help you to get to where you want to be? And the same goes for auto loans too, like banks and credit unions, they both offer, you know, some pretty great loan products for auto loans for cars and boats and, you know, whatever you need a truck. Um, but if you go to these alternative places, you know, they might offer you something instantly, but the interest rate might be a lot higher and you might be paying on it for a lot longer. So I always tell people, like, make sure that you look at all of your options, because I'm one of those folks that believes that there's always an option. <laughs> you know, you don't always have to jump at the first. 
And then with credit cards, what's really great about traditional financial services as well is that there are ways to play the credit game without getting yourself into a bunch of retail credit card debt. You know, and Omari is going to talk a little bit about that, but essentially, you know, a credit card is, you know, a plastic card, right? And it allows you to uh, pay for something now when you would have to make payments for it over time, right? So it's kind of getting the product now and you're borrowing the money and making monthly payments um, until it's paid off to get it. So a lot of times with credit cards, you know, they come with a cost, but the helpful thing is, is that you get it now, right? So we, we always try to tell our clients, like, you know, there are good ways to use the credit. I saw something in the chat earlier that said, I wish that I would have known that all debt wasn't bad. You know, there's there's a good way to use it, and then there's a way to use it that might be considered unhealthy, right? So Amari's going to talk to us about how to maximize these financial services so that we can use them in the healthiest way possible. Totally. So thank you for that. That was super informative. Um, the first thing that I'll say in terms of uh, maximizing your financial services to reach your dreams, dream path of call. Um, we are a financial nonprofit focused on education and resources. So the goal is for us to help you understand what options you have, um, create a holistic step-by-step um, -step action plan to help you um, set the right expectations and know what you need to do to get to that end goal. Um, the good news is though, um, I'm gonna give you a strategy. I'm gonna give you a quick strategy here right now, right? We talked about, and it's, it's all tied into this idea of not all debt being bad debt. Uh, we talked about credit cards. We talked about uh, credit, right? So building credit and understanding what steps you need to take in order to start that credit building process. So uh, taking a low credit score, for example, um, one really easy way to start that process to both uh, control the debt that you have and also start to improve your credit score is um, something that we like to call the uh, set it and forget it method. So uh, just a, a quick example, right? Say you uh, we're able to get a small secure credit card from your bank or credit union. Say it's a $200 uh, secure credit card. And secure credit card means that you would, since you're maybe you're in a place where your credit's not fully developed yet, or you're still working on improving your credit, uh, your bank will be willing to work with you to provide a card for you, but they may require that you put down your own down payment first before they give you the card. So say, for example, if there's a secure credit card worth $200, they will ask you for a $200 deposit that they'll use as collateral against that 200 or against that credit line. And basically you're paying yourself back each month. It's a good, it's a good way to start building credit. It's a good entry point into playing the credit game. Um, and so with that in mind, one, one really easy strategy, especially in this sort of digital age where many of us are, are doing subscriptions, we do stuff like Netflix, Hulu, et cetera. Try taking one or two of your subscriptions, whether it be Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, whatever the case, um, and put them, assign them to your to your secure credit card so that it's paid every month through that credit card. The next thing that you would want to do is then set the credit card to be paid in full each month. Again, not the minimum, pay in full each month automatically. Most credit cards, secure credit cards will give you the option to do that. Um, it might be something you could do online, or it might be something that you'd have to call in, but most will give you the opportunity to do that. So now what you've got is you've got an automated billing service. You've got your, your Amazon or your Netflix getting charged to your credit, to your secure credit card every month. And you also have automatically your secure credit card being paid off in full each month. So now you've got a, an automated situation where you can have your credit card working for you and being paid so you can, it's out of sight, out of mind, without you being tempted to spend that card and charge it up in a way that's unhealthy, right? You could even put it in a drawer somewhere, not even have it near you and it's still working for you, right? So that's a, a nice um, sort of a, a, a life hack as if you wanna call it, that can help you get started on that credit, uh, that credit building process with a little bit of ease. Hopefully that, does that make sense, Tina? Yeah, I love, like, we were talking about this earlier, and he's like, I'm going to talk about the set it and forget it. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, I, I never heard that. Like, I never use that in my counseling. So I like that Omari put, like, a kind of a strategy, like, word behind it, like a set it and forget it. I won't mm -hmm. forget that. Like, I'm never going to forget that now. <laughs> so I like that little life <laughs> hack. Um, yeah. I have a question coming in, and I think 
I think it's appropriate that we address it right now. Um, we sure. will be offering some time for Q and A later. But somebody asked, "Do you offer secured credit cards, and is there a minimum score required for approval?" So Green Path, a lot of people call us and they think that we've got money to lend, or they think that we are, you know, like a bank or a credit union. Green Path does not have any kind of money to lend. We don't have any products or services that are you know, loans at Green Path, we, what we can do is we can tell you, you know, based on your financial situation, these are the types of products that we would recommend or the types of services that we would recommend that you seek out. We're not able to give you a specific like lender or financial institution to go to, but we certainly can help navigate and help you figure out what would best fit your situation. As far as the approval goes, um, we absolutely can talk to you about what that might look like. Because different financial institutions, you know, um, banks and credit unions, they a lot of times it's not like a set. This is how much you have to have. This is the score that we look for. Um, that can vary depending on the financial institution at Green Path. Though, what we can do is we can tell you, like, it's likely that this might be a really good fit for you. Um, it's likely that, you know, something like Credit Karma might tell you to apply for this, but that's not what we might recommend, right? So it's always good to to kind of reach out to us like one on one. We can customize that answer for you to give you some better, you know, a better path forward. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So Omari, I've got some questions for you. Are you ready? <laughs> sure. So I know that we talked about a lot about kind of barriers and and inclusion and access specifically and this is probably the the part that i'm the most excited for and what a lot of our folks are on here today to learn about so you've been doing a lot of research like you've been doing a lot of work with the inclusion diversity equity and access can you talk to us a little bit more about like what that is and the work that you're doing with it sure <laughs> So I actually forgot that this picture was in this presentation. And the reason why I bring that up is because I almost wore that jacket for this presentation. Which was <laughs> um, it's a good jacket. <laughs> I like it. No, it is. It's nice. Um, so, yeah, um, essentially inclusion, diversity, equity and access is an initiative that Green Path is committed to. And, and what it means is to really show up authentically with awareness of, of strengths and opportunities both internally and externally. So what that means is internally, we wanna make sure that uh, black indigenous POC, um, other uh, members of the LGBTQIA community, other underrepresented groups within Green Path feel safe and respected and that their voices are heard and uplifted. Um, externally, Green Path is committed to acknowledging systemic disadvantages that underinvested communities face and understand how those experiences impact their path towards financial wellness and then create experiences and resources designed to earnestly meet those needs with those challenges in mind that sort of goes back to this idea of of, of financial inclusion right we want to really make sure that that's that that happens yeah thanks for that so we we basically just want to make sure that everybody you know, is met where they're at. We're not missing anybody. There's no missed opportunities. Everybody is going to be able to have a customized path to, to get to where they're going. And we hopefully, we want to be able to make it easier for people, right? Definitely. Yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up. All right. Well, thank you so much, Omari. I'm excited to hear. I know that you're still his work is still in the, in the works, right? It's still in the making. Um, he's yeah, researching I mean, boots on the ground. Can you talk just a little bit about what you're sure. doing in the local community? So uh, Green Path is a, is a Michigan based company, even though we are um, uh, nationwide in terms of our reach. Um, and so as a result, the first and, and as a Detroit native, one of the first things that I noticed when I started working here is the fact that despite how, how much excellent work Green Path does, there's not a there's not as big a footprint in the city of Detroit as as I would feel comfortable with, right? Because I, as I've talked about earlier in the presentation, Detroit is a community that really could benefit from some of the resources that Green Path has to offer. Um, and 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 so the goal is to figure out how we might show up more authentically to meet the needs of of folks in Detroit. Um, and in order to do that, it's this is where these these earnest conversations around financial 
equity and inclusion come into play because in order to make change or to help make change, we need to first understand the nature of what these barriers are and how they came to be. Uh, and so we've tried to, COVID has obviously made it difficult, but we've tried to um, have conversations with, with Detroiters to understand from their perspective what these challenges are um, and, and what they think some of the solutions may be. And one of the early results of, of that ongoing work is to is uh, is that we we heard that there was a need a true need to understand credit better and that th there those entry points that the information around credit that already exists is a little bit unattainable it's a little bit not really relevant to the situations that that many folks are in you know there are folks that that aren't banked that may not have a savings account that might not have a consistent income um, and and therefore the information out there that pertains to, to how you might improve your credit um, might not always make sense. It might not always be relevant. So we are building uh, and have built um, a credit tool, um, a digital learning experience that takes into the consider it takes into consideration where your starting point might be, where you might be in terms of your credit journey, and give information around credit and how you might build credit that speaks to where you're starting from, that speaks to your starting point, that has that in mind. Um, and that's something that we're testing right now um, and pretty good about it, but it's something we wanna get out in front of folks to make sure that it's actually helping. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Omari. All right, Absolutely. so we, we've got a lot of questions coming through the chat. We have about three minutes left for the webinar portion. So we wanted to wrap that up and then we'll hop back to the questions. Um, and we have those captured in the chat, so we can always send out any answers that we might have later along with the recording. As we we wrap up and we think about kind of what Omari was talking about with some barriers and inclusion and making sure that all of us have access to all of these healthy resources. We wanted to know from you just to get you motivated, especially because we're still in the beginning part of 2021. What are some of your financial goals and dreams? Can you share those in the chat box for us? I think mine, honestly, like I, I mentioned this in the beginning, but I think I'll be able to start thinking uh, bigger and happier <laughs> once we have our savings account like back to quote unquote normal, you know, once I can sleep a little bit better at night. But I think one of my financial goals is like to reduce stress and feel a little bit more prepared because I am such a planner. I've got buy a home free from student debt. I'm right there with you. I can retire. I can travel. So all of these things that y'all are kind of throwing in here. You know, we want to say that we're here to help you. You know, we are the financial wellness experts here at Green Path. Feel free to give us a call. We're always here um, to help you on your financial wellness journey, no matter where you are. If you're just getting started or if, you know, maybe you've hit a bump in the road or maybe just like life has changed and you're like, OK, like, I think I'm doing OK, but I need some validation. You know, I need that from you. Feel free to give us a call 877-337-3399. It's free and confidential to talk to us. If you want to learn more about us, you can also visit Green Path online and you can request a call directly from our website as well. Absolutely. So I think now um, I am going to stop the recording for right now, Omari, and then we will jump into some of the Q&A. Sounds good. I look forward to it. All right, so I have somebody that asked, how are you, Omari, facilitating the discussions and the research? It's a good question. Uh, it's a ch it's been a challenge uh, <laughs> because of COVID. Um, I have a background as a community organizer. Um, and so in an ideal world, what that would look like would be to um, find the community spaces, right? Find the spaces where uh, the community gathers and where there are uh, leaders in place already, whether that be a church, um, a barber shop, a grocery store, some some community centric location um, and and just show up and 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 have conversations with with folks that have the reach, uh, some of the leaders that are already there so that I'm not trying to build. So I, I'm not having I can overcome the, the, the barrier of being an outsider coming in. Right. Even though I'm from Detroit and I may be working in Detroit, 
um, that doesn't mean my experience is the same as everyone else's, right? So finding uh, those hub spaces, those hub, those community leaders um, and having conversations with them um, to then gather to help the, the gathering process of the folks in the community that may need to, to hear this, um, that may benefit from it, it would be the ideal way. Uh, what I've what we've tried to do in a COVID scenario is a similar uh, process, but just using technology, whether it be Zoom or WebEx or whatever um, kind of digital tool that we have. But it's definitely been a, been a challenge. Um, technology is is something that's still, uh, for some communities, a, a privilege, right? Like there there's not always equal access to technology, so that's a challenge that we're that we're having to overcome. Um, but it's a good it's a good question, and we're doing our best with with the tools that we have available. Yeah, thanks for that answer. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I did just chat this into the chat, but we do appreciate your time. We know that life is super busy, even though we're kind of virtual right now. Like it, I feel like I'm busier than I ever was. So we do want to thank the time that you took to do this webinar today. And we hope that we connect with you soon. Again, visit us online or give us a call. Um, and then we will kind of jump into more of the questions here, Omari.